This is a homily for the third Sunday of Easter. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus is found only in the Gospel of St. Luke. Luke tells us that Emmaus is 60 stadia from Jerusalem a distance of about 12 kilometres or just over seven miles. It is the third day since the crucifixion, and these two disciples are talking together about all that had happened. There are four things to note here. Firstly, the two disciples are leaving Jerusalem following Passover. Secondly, they have lost Jesus in the sense that the one whom they believed to be the Messiah had been crucified like a common criminal. Thirdly, this was the third day since this had happened. And fourthly, the disciples have failed to understand what has just happened. As they walk along, they are talking about what has just happened, trying to make sense of the crucifixion and the empty tomb. Luke gives us the name of one of these disciples, Cleopas. The other disciple remains unnamed. It's interesting to note that most artistic representations of the road to Emmaus presume that the companion of Cleopas is another male. If you Google Road to Emmaus, by far and away the majority of images that you will see are of Jesus and two male disciples. Here, for example, we have Caravaggio's famous painting. Note two male disciples. Here you can see Hendrik de Bruggen's painting. Again, we have two male disciples. The exceptions to this trend are a minority, but here you have Giselle Bausch's Road to Emmaus with a male and a female, and likewise with Walter Rain's painting, Jesus with a male and female disciple. So does it really matter whether there were two male disciples or a male disciple, Cleopas, and his wife? The short answer would have to be no, but I'd like to look at two persuasive scriptural reasons that suggest a male and female disciple, Cleopas and his wife. But before we look at the reasons suggesting a male and female disciple, let me remind you that on September the 30th, 2019, Pope Francis issued an apostolic letter announcing that the third Sunday in ordinary time would be celebrated as the Sunday of the Word of God, a special day devoted to the celebration, study and sharing of the Word of God. This year, the third Sunday of ordinary time fell on January the 22nd. You can access copies of this apostolic letter from the Vatican website. It is technically called a motu proprio and is known by its Latin title, a peruit illis. A banner with the logo for the Sunday of the Word of God was displayed above the main entrance to St. Peter's Basilica on that Sunday. And if you look a little closer, you'll notice that the logo is a scene from today's Gospel, two disciples with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You'll notice, though, that Jesus is accompanied by a man and a woman. When Archbishop Rino Fisichella, the President of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization, presented the logo at a Vatican press conference, he noted that Luke explicitly mentions the name of one of the disciples, Cleopas. But he also said that some exegetes acknowledge that his companion is his wife. So, for example, the New Testament scholar, the late George Caird, 
wrote this, commenting on translations that use the words, O foolish men. O foolish men goes beyond the limits of strict translation, for there is no noun in the Greek, and a man and a woman would necessarily be addressed in the masculine. The two disciples lived in the same house, and were therefore presumably man and wife. If Cleopas is the Clopas of John chapter 19 verse 25, then his wife Mary had been one of the group of women at the cross. The logo for the Sunday of the Word of God is taken from the icon you can see to the right. The Italian words around the logo are Domenica della Parola di Dio, Sunday of the Word of God. The icon was written by the late Egyptian-born Benedictine Sister Marie Paul Faran, a member of the Benedictine Monastery on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Sadly, Sister Marie Paul died in May 2019. Note that we speak of icons being written rather than painted. Two disciples are walking to Emmaus, probably returning home after celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. They are joined by a stranger. We, of course, know that it is Jesus, but they fail to recognize him. No doubt, they would have regarded him as a fellow pilgrim returning home from the celebration of Passover. The stranger asks them what they are discussing, and they stood still, their faces downcast. Cleopas replies, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know what has been happening there these last few days? The irony is, of course, that this stranger is the only one who truly does know what has just happened in Jerusalem. But Jesus asks, what sort of things? Cleopas then explains what had happened to Jesus and about their hopes that he would be the one to set Israel free. He then tells the stranger that some women from their group went to the tomb, but could not find the body. They had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive, but of him they saw nothing. Jesus then says, How foolish you are, so slow to believe all that the prophets said. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then, starting from Moses and from all the prophets, he explained to them the passages about himself throughout the scriptures. New Testament scholar Richard Hayes makes this observation. The authors of the four canonical Gospels shared the early Christian community's passionate concern, a concern that, as far as we can tell, goes back to Jesus himself to show that Jesus' teachings and actions, as well as his violent death and ultimate vindication, constituted the continuation and climax of the ancient biblical story. The story of Cleopas and his companion, quite possibly his wife, is in the final chapter of Luke's Gospel. It parallels another story about a man and his wife found towards the beginning of the Gospel in chapter 2. That is the story about Mary and Joseph finding the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. The two stories function something like bookends in Luke's Gospel. Let's turn briefly to the story of Mary and Joseph losing and finding the young Jesus. You may recall that the family had made the journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. When the festivities are over, Mary and Joseph set out to return home to Nazareth. Today, that's a trip of 147 kilometres by road, but Jewish pilgrims from the Galilee region on the way to Jerusalem and returning home from Jerusalem 
would have made a detour through the Transjordan to avoid passing through Samaria. So it would have been a trip of at least a week. We have absolutely no way of knowing how many pilgrims had come from Nazareth that year. We know that the population of Nazareth at that time was less than 500. So it's quite plausible that as many as 200 people from the village had made the pilgrimage. The village of Nazareth would have been like an extended family. Everyone knew everyone else, and many of them were interrelated. It might seem strange to us today that Mary and Joseph only realised that Jesus wasn't with them after a whole day's journey. But in that culture, they would have assumed quite reasonably that he was somewhere among the large caravan from Nazareth. But when they hadn't seen him after a whole day, they became worried. They looked for him among their relations and acquaintances, but he was nowhere to be found. So Mary and Joseph rush back to Jerusalem. The Gospels tell us that they found him after three days, and they found him in the temple. Mary and Joseph are understandably overcome when they see him. And his mother says to him, My child, why have you done this to us? See how worried your father and I have been looking for you. And Jesus replies, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be busy with my father's affairs? But the evangelist tells us that neither Joseph nor Mary understood what he meant. Note four things in this story. Firstly, Mary and Joseph are leaving Jerusalem following the celebration of Passover, when, secondly, they realise they have lost Jesus. Thirdly, they find him on the third day. But fourthly, they fail to understand. Notice the parallels with the Emmaus story. Cleopas and his companion are leaving Jerusalem following Passover. They have lost Jesus in the sense that he was crucified as a common criminal. It is the third day on which they meet Jesus, and they have failed to understand what has happened. So these two stories frame Luke's Gospel. And in doing this, Luke is telling us why he has written his Gospel, and perhaps why we are reading it. He wants to help us find Jesus, to help us understand that his death and resurrection is the fulfilment of Scripture. The parallel between these two stories is still strong if Cleopas's companion is another man, but I think there is a strong case for arguing that his companion is his wife. Now the Emmaus story ends with Jesus Cleopas and his companion approaching the village to which they were going. Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. Cleopas and his companion invite the mysterious stranger to stay with them, presumably in their own home. It was customary in that culture for the guest to turn down such an invitation until it was vigorously repeated. Theologically, Jesus' action demonstrates that he never forces himself upon others. At their invitation, Jesus then enters their home and they share a meal together. While at table, Jesus takes bread, says the blessing, breaks it and hands it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, but he vanishes from their sight. Notice the sequence of action at table. In a way that's clearly meant to recall the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, chapter 22, verses 19 to 20, and also the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, chapter 9, verse 16, Jesus took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Now look 
at the key elements of the Emmaus story at this crucial moment. Firstly, people eating. Secondly, eyes are opened. And finally, recognition. Can you think of another biblical story where we find these same three elements? Eating, eyes opened, and recognition. Let's go back to the very beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, to the story of Adam and Eve. God creates the man and the woman and places them in the Garden of Eden. The Garden was, in a word, paradise. There was only one limitation in the Garden. Only one. No restrictions whatsoever except one. God tells them that they may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden with one exception. They are not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But a serpent appears and says to the woman, Did God really say you were not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? She replies, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it, nor touch it, under pain of death. No, says the serpent, you will not die. God knows, in fact, that the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods, knowing good from evil. Eve is attracted by the serpent's clever arguments. How familiar they are! How many times have we heard them? It won't hurt you. You don't know what you've been missing. Eve thinks it over. She saw that the tree was good to eat and pleasing to the eye, and that it was enticing for the wisdom that it could give. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The effects are instantaneous. Shame and fear. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. But then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid among the trees. God calls to the man, Where are you? This is a question that God asks all of us. Where are you? Where am I in relation to the person God created me to be? And like the man and the woman, we too are so often hiding in the trees. The man replies, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you that you were naked? Have you been eating of the tree I forbade you to eat? Adam flounders desperately. He thinks now only of himself and blames Eve. He tries to put as much distance between himself and her as he can, even blaming God at the same time. It was the woman you put with me. It's all your fault. God then asks the woman, What is this you have done? She then blames the serpent. The serpent tempted me, and I ate. As a result, God banishes the man and the woman from the garden. And to make sure that they could never again enter the garden, God placed great winged creatures to guard the way to the tree of life. From now on, they will earn their food by the sweat of their face until they return to the ground. And then we have the words used on Ash Wednesday, For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Paradise had been theirs, now 
it is lost. They are now exiles. Was that simply because they ate a piece of fruit? Well, remember the tree from which the woman had taken the fruit. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what does taking that fruit mean? Taking fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the equivalent to making a grab for moral autonomy. It's a way of saying, I will decide what is right and what is wrong. I'm not going to be told by anyone else. This is a form of idolatry because the only person who could possibly know all the consequences of any action is God. Idolatry is, in fact, the essence of all sin. It seeks to displace God from the centre of our lives. We bow down and worship something other than God. As a result, creation is subjected to decay, futility, sorrow exile and alienation. As we read in the book of Genesis, a curse be the soil because of you. Painfully will you get your food from it as long as you live. It will yield you brambles and thistles as you eat the produce of the land. By the sweat of your face will you earn your food until you return to the ground as you were taken from it. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So let's focus on some of the key elements in the story. Three things happen. Firstly, the man and the woman take the fruit and eat it. Secondly, their eyes are opened. And that leads, thirdly, to recognition. They realise they are naked. Parallel that with the disciples at table with Jesus. They take food. In this case, it's bread. Secondly, their eyes are opened, and the moment of recognition follows. They recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread. Eyes were opened. To make sure that we make this connection between the two stories, Luke has used exactly the same three Greek words used in the Greek version of Genesis the Septuagint. De enochthesan hoi ophthalmoi. So, what is Luke telling us? When, in the book of Genesis, the man and woman eat the fruit, creation is subjected to decay, futility, sorrow, exile and alienation. Now, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the curse has been broken. God's new creation has burst in upon this world of decay and sorrow. The curse has been broken and death has been defeated. The Emmaus story is a celebration of the end of our exile from Eden. God's new creation has burst in upon the world of decay and sorrow. So, coming back to Cleopas and his companion, we can say this. Although it's not essential that Cleopas' companion is his wife, Luke seems to suggest it by inviting us to parallel the Emmaus story with two other stories of a husband and wife. The story of Mary and Joseph, husband and wife, finding the young Jesus in the temple. And the story of Adam and Eve, husband and wife, eating the forbidden fruit. The meal at Emmaus heralds the recreation of God's fallen world, or we could say that it heralds the bringing of present creation into line with the original design of God, a design that up until now has been thwarted by human sin.